all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so once again today we have with us dr mark a levit he is the head of pelvic reconstruction surgery pediatric pelvic reconstruction surgery in children's hospital so dr levit welcome hi again so i'm very quickly going to just introduce the site so if somebody is looking for you they can find where you are so this is children's national hospital pediatric colorectal and pelvic reconstruction surgery department this is the contact number this is the introduction to or bio for dr levet so recently mark levet md colorectal and pelvic reconstructive surgeon joined our children's national hospital community to lead our new highly specialized colorectal surgery program this program will be the first in mid atlantic region to fully integrate surgery urology gynecology and gastroenterology into one cohesive program for children and if you read on dr levet went to medical school in new york and if i go back here for a second he has performed over 10000 surgeries to address a wide spectrum of problems involving the colon and rectum more than any other full time practicing pediatric surgeon in the world so just think about the ambience of our discussions that we have dr levet with us so once again welcome tell us how are your days what are you going to do over this weekend thank you so much all is well um well this weekend we're going to go see the cherry blossoms in washington dc they are at their best in about a one week period of time and i'm told tomorrow on the national mall is a kite flying event also so we're going to look in the sky and see a whole bunch of kites awesome thank you very much so let's start i'm going to share my screen and we go so um thank you again for the invitation we are um continuing our series of discussion related to colon and rectal issues for children We have previously talked about patients that are born without a normal anal opening and need surgery for that. We've also talked about Hirschsprung's disease, where the nerves of the colon are not successfully working and therefore they can't pass stool. This is a um, talk which will incorporate some of those patients, because some of those patients have soiling, also known as fecal incontinence. but a large group of patients who are not covered by those two congenital disorders those with very severe constipation which might come as a surprise to people can be so significant that it can really impact a child's quality of life and might even need a surgeon and patients with a variety of spinal problems most commonly spina bifida which can also affect the bowels and their ability to empty and the ability of that child to be clean for stool. Um so that's really what our focus is today is fecal incontinence and constipation. All right. Um well, I hope some of you have read this book um perhaps to your kids or your grandkids or your nieces and nephews. and i have taken the lessons of this book uh very passionately um because i know that there is another book that co goes along with this book and that is the next slide and that's this book so of course this is a bit of a joke but the poo here winnie the poo getting stuck is what my whole life is about is trying to unstuck poo um and there are many kids that have a problem with uh, the ability to poop um and the manifestations of that are quite significant and perhaps the most dramatic manifestation of that is soiling and having accidents and not being able to wear normal underwear and therefore being a socially shunned because of that and my mission in life is to get all of these patients clean and in normal underwear and doing the things that all regular kids are doing all right well let's uh, begin our discussion with understanding what it is that makes one continent 
and I suspect you haven't thought much about this. Well, we have a fascinating system whereby our sphincters that surround the anus work. We have actually two sphincter. We have external sphincters, which we control as powerfully as our own arms and legs. We can direct them to do function, in this case, to squeeze the anal canal and keep a poop inside. We also have an internal sphincter, which is smooth muscle, with which we for about which we don't have any control, but retains tone around the anal canal and keeps us from passing stool when we're not thinking about stool. Um, and it's an incredible part of the body because it has both of those sphincters. There's no place else in the body that has the double sphincter. We have plenty of controllable muscles, our skeletal muscle, our arms, legs, etc. And we have a couple locations with smooth muscle, like the uh, esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter that needs to know that you want to swallow before it allows the contents of your esophagus that you just chewed in your mouth to enter your stomach. And we have your, we have the pyloric muscle that only opens when the stomach is finished churning the food and then allows the liquid form of the food into the small bowel. Well, the anus has both sphincters. So quick question for you. Um, somebody commented here, actually, let me just show it to you. Rajesh said sphincter equals valve. So is a sphincter equal to a valve? Yes, I, I agree with that. The one difference relative to the anus is you have a sphincter that you do not have control over, but knows to relax when there is stool in the vault. It just does it. That's actually called, that's a reflex called the rectoanal inhibitory reflex, R-A-I-R, also known as RARE, and the external sphincter that you control. So as soon as your internal sphincter relaxes, Thank goodness you have external sphincter control. Otherwise, the stool would pass at that very moment. You consciously close that sphincter with the muscles that you control, and then you find yourself to a bathroom, and then you choose at the appropriate time to relax the sphincters that you have control over. So that's the complex sphincter mechanism. And sure, it functions like a valve, but two components to the valve, one you have control of and one you don't, both Got it. working to avoid passage of stool when you don't want it to pass. Now, in addition to the sphincters, you have a very sensate part of the body as, as sensitive as your fingertips. And if you closed your eyes and I put a coin in your hand, you could feel the coin and say, this feels like a nickel or a dime or a quarter, that's pretty incredible. Well, the anus can detect solid, liquid, and gas. And you can detect whether they're solid there and decide, I better hold into my hold on to my sphincters and find a bathroom. Or you can detect that in fact it's gas and let that pass um, without going to find a bathroom. So that is the anal canal sensation. And then the third component of continence depends on how quickly does the colon move. Does it move fast or does it move slow? Most of us have very reliable motility. We can expect a bowel movement once per day. But there are certain scenarios where the colon moves very, very slowly to the point of impaction and no passage of stool. And there are scenarios whereby the colon moves very quickly. And perhaps some of you have experienced that if you ever get traveler's diarrhea, you have very loose stool. And thank goodness you have good sphincters and an anal canal that detects the stool so that you don't have an accident when your motility is moving very quickly. Got it. Thank you. So I actually predict that this is a fourth grader who will one day be a colorectal surgeon like myself, because on their science test, they wrote these answers to name a solid, name a liquid, and name a gas. And I 
got such a kick. I got such a kick out of this that I thought I would reproduce it for you. It is interesting, yes. So solid is a poo, liquid is a pee, and gas is a fart. <laughs> and they are correct. They are correct. Okay. So which children have problems? I mentioned this at the beginning. Patients with anorectal malformations and Hirschsprungs, the two surgical conditions that I talk, uh, that I help, that we talked about on previous um, uh, presentations with you, but then the spinal patients that have the um, innervation or the muscle is problematic because of what's going on in their spine. And then uh, patients who have constipation, just such severe constipation that they have can have incontinence problems related to the fact that the stools move very slowly or that the sphincters don't work appropriately. So quick question here, these spinal problems, can these be, as you uh, alluded to, for example, spina bifida, so can these be by birth or acquired later by various both. pathologies or accidents? Both, both. Um, spinal problems is a very broad category. It can be uh, happen at birth, spina bifida, various uh, things like a myelomeningocele, if you've heard of that. And then, of course, you could have a spinal injury. So all of this could affect the control of the bowel. We take care of those Got patients it. as well. Got it. And I think you would also like this comment that I'm seeing here. So Pam is jamming, has uh, created an emoji for the other diagram that we just saw. Oh. <laughs> Now it's funny. If that, thank you, Pam. If that kid was asked that question uh, today, he could answer it with emojis instead of writing out those words. So, thank you for jamming that. Appreciate it. Um, One more question. Sorry. So Kelly says, is there a genetic aspect to motility? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, we believe so. It hasn't really been determined. But there's no question that motility disorders do seem on occasion to run in families where a parent had problem passing stool regularly and their child has it as well. But no genetic factors have yet been identified, except, of course, Hirschsprung's disease, which we already talked about. But these motility patients that we're going to talk about today are really um, different because they don't have Hirschsprung's disease. In fact, we don't know exactly why their colons move slowly. But yes, uh, sometimes this does tend to run in families. Got it. So just one more question and we'll go back. This question is interesting as well. So Kerry says, sometimes body sensation is not correct, that it's just gas. Children are easily embarrassed by accident and it's value, valuable to reassure them that adults do have an accident sometimes too. So the question from here is, is there a developmental milestone where this sensation becomes more mature and more understood and yes. in the beginning or that's, it is yeah that's a very wise uh, question i think um, over time behaviorally we learn um what is solid and what is gas and when an adult might have an accident it's because they misjudged and it wasn't gas in fact it was liquid stool and i'll tell you a little story about that one of my associates once was traveling and came back and had the traveler's diarrhea that i was um, speaking about and when he came back to work we asked him how is he feeling and he said i'm much better but i am not yet passing gas with confidence and I think that little story tells a lot. Um, and a poop. it felt like a fart, but it was a whole poop. That That is an interesting term. I appreciate that as well. Um, we um, can lose the ability to know whether it's solid, liquid, or gas when the liquid, when the stool is liquid. It's much harder to detect which is a very important principle for the care of these children, is we want them to have formed stool. And honestly, one of the mistakes that pediatricians often make is they give the child a stool softener that softens the stool and actually increases the accidents. 
because they are less likely to know that there is stool in the vault and they are less likely to close their sphincters in time. So you actually want a relatively formed stool, not to the point of impaction or hard stool, but you want a formed stool. And then that needs to come at a reliable time. And that's how you develop bowel control. And that's the potty training process that obviously many of the parents on this call are well versed in. You cannot, Roger, potty, you, you cannot potty train someone who is stooling 10 times a day. It just simply won't happen. So th this, this cartoon is an illustration of an important factor, particularly myself who deals with surgical patients. I don't want to treat constipation or fecal incontinence until I know that the patient's anatomy is good. I want to make sure that the anatomy is as good as it can get. And if the patient had prior surgery on their anal area, then we have to be certain that that surgery was done properly, that the anus is the right size and it is properly located within the sphincter mechanism. We want to know, are the sphincters doing what they're supposed to be doing? Relaxing at the appropriate time, contracting, at the appropriate time. So the first question that needs to be asked, and sadly is often not asked, is the anatomy okay? And we have some routine here at our colorectal program to determine if the anatomy is okay. Usually it involves investigating under anesthesia, looking at the anatomy. We can actually contract the sphincters and make sure that they're strong and make sure that the anus is in the center of them and some various x-rays that we do to confirm that the anatomy is as good as it's going to get with the goal to maximize the child's potential for voluntary, meaning controlled, bowel movements. So this is one of the x-rays that we do. Here on the left is a plain x-ray, which you can see has impacted stool in the rectum, that big circle is all hard impacted stool and these patients may have that stool ball and then they leak small amounts of stool and stain the underwear the contrast study of that same patient is the image on the right which shows very clearly that the colon has a lot of hard stool in it that's the dark area is hard stool and the colon has a, a significant redundancy it takes a pretty strong curve going up like a roller coaster up 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 curving down 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 and then back up yep there so it's the i call it the loop de loop like on the roller coaster and this is pretty good evidence that that's this colon is going to move slowly one so, more question for you then uh these dark areas are they all stools or these are food material or of processed material or gas as well at this point i mean you can see there's some some fuzziness to them those those look like stool balls hard stool balls it's not food because it's now been processed to the point of stool all the nutrients have been removed the water has been removed and you're left with hard stool so hydration is a really important thing to do um, to try to avoid constipation but obviously these patients often need much more treatment than just being well hydrated, but we probably all know that on a hot day where we didn't drink enough, we might get constipated. Got it. And my apologies, one more question. This real, uh, this loop-de-loop, -loop, as you said, of this colon, isn't this a problem as well that at some point there, there could become surgical emergencies? Yes, um, that's a very good thought. Yes, the, the loop-de-loop -loop can be problematic and cause something called a volvulus which is yeah. pretty rare. Um, I used to think that that loop-de-loop -loop in a very severely constipated patient would need to be removed. However, we have learned that many of these colons can get better um, and don't need to be removed. And I don't remove colons very often in this circumstance anymore. Got it. Thank you. So this is a little bit of a summary of the predictors of continence as it relates to the four diagnoses. So in an anorectal malformation patient, which we've already discussed, 
in a previous uh, meeting, um, the type of malformation, the quality of the sacrum and the quality of the spine are the determinants of the patient's potential for continence. When it comes to Hirschsprung's disease, HD, what is the quality of the sphincters? Is the anal canal, also known as the dentate line, intact? And is the colonic motility a factor? Those are the predictors of continence. When it comes to the spine, or a spinal problem, how well is the anal canal functioning? How well are the sphincters functioning? And of course, the effect of these are the type of spinal lesion you're dealing with. Spina bifida is a very broad spectrum from very severe to mild. And then in functional constipation, we wanna know what's happening at the anal sphincter and what's happening of the, with the motility of the colon. Um, and depending on which of these four groups of patients come to see me, we need to evaluate these components and figure out how to treat the patient. Got it. A quick question, and this may be something that probably would come in next in the next discussion, but let me just ask this so it is something at the top of your mind as well. So Pam is jamming, saying, how do you fix hard impacted stools? I will get to that, Pam. Give me a couple more slides. Oops. All right. Yep. So... So the treatment, the umbrella term I use is bowel management, which is basically a way to control the colon and thereby keep the patient clean. So if we can reliably empty the colon at a reliable time, then the patient will become clean. Meaning if we know when the poop is coming and we get the poop out, and no poop passes for the next 24 hours, which is most of our routine, then that patient is clean in a normal underwear because they won't have an accident between passages of stool. Got it. So the treatment to answer Pam's question is comes in two forms, mechanical, i.e. enemas, and enemas can be done rectally from down to up or through a really cool operation, and I'll show you pictures of that called a Malone, whereby the colon is flushed from the top to the down. And we are blessed with an appendix that is the first structure of the colon, which happens to look like a very thin worm. And through that tubular structure, we can pass a catheter and give the enema in a much more comfortable and pleasant way and avoid the rectal root. But they're both intended to mechanically empty the colon. And if you remove the stool once per day and no stool passes for the next 24 hours, you are then a clean patient done in a mechanical somewhat artificial way, but the result is you are clean and in normal underwear. Now, for, th for those who have the potential for bowel control, but just simply don't empty enough, those patients need laxatives. And it's very important that they are what's called a stimulant laxative. They provoke the stool to empty rather, as I mentioned earlier, than a stool softener. Because a stool softener will simply make the stools thinner, they won't help it come out, and then they will have leakages throughout the day. So you've actually made them worse. Now, how do you make this work? Usually you need a stimulant laxative that provokes the stool, but you don't want it too liquid. So you add a water-soluble fiber to give the stool a little bit of bind, binding, a little bulk, and that bulked up stool gets pushed out by the effect of the stimulant laxative. And an important factor here is diet to improve the form and the consistency of the stool very much depends on what you eat. And this is another one of my funny slides of a patient who had a little bit too much fiber. Um, um, of course, I'm kidding. 
that's a carrot, but looks a lot like a foot. So we have to figure out how to give a patient the correct amount of fiber. All right, now on the other side of that coin is a fast moving colon. And there are patients who have hypermotility. There are patients out there who have lost their colon. A surgeon may have removed their colon for conditions such as ulcerative colitis, as an example. Now they need to be slowed down. So 10 stools a day, they can't control, but one stool a day, they can control. A constipating diet, uh, taking care of the skin and making sure you've solved diaper rashes, fiber, water soluble fiber in this case slows you down sometimes you need a small enema then there are a number of medicines we use loperamide cholestyramine levsin uh, lamotil and on rare occasion clonidine there are a number of ways to slow down the stool medically we want one stool a day ideally certainly less than three should be able to translate into successful bowel control, provided that the patient has the mechanisms to achieve continence if the stool is the right consistency. Because if, if the stool is a perfect consistency and you don't have sphincters, doesn't matter. But if you have sphincters and the stool is the right consistency, you should be able to have bowel control. You got it. And what this is, is a, um, a compilation of data from patients who were fully fecally incontinent. They had no capacity for voluntary bowel movements. And using a mechanical system, enemas from top down or enemas from bottom up, this is our result of one year. And this is very, very nursing intensive. So we're doing well, but we could obviously do better. But this is a sustainable treatment that I was proud to publish that shows that, in fact, we can really improve these patients from no continence at all to a vast majority of them are clean. And I will talk in the next session about how we do that. What are some of the surgical ways that we can improve a patient to get them to be perfectly clean and in normal underwear. Very interesting. So this is such a important paper and, and your observation or your procedures that 587 patients and they they uh, they have an, uh, some of them have anorectal malformation and Hirschsprung and functional constipation and spinal cord issues and then this is a, a this is up from zero, correct? Yes, so this is up from zero, but prior to this study, the only publication was at one week. And we said, you know what? It's not so easy to maintain that success. So we studied it at one year and we were able with our techniques to maintain that success, but we're very honest. This is not 100%. I would love it to be 100% for every child. But some children need more work. And as I talked about in the Hirschsprung's group, those patients have a lot of challenges because their sphincters often don't work properly. Um, and those are not as easy to control. So I think we had good success with them, but not as good success as with some of the other groups. You got it. Cool. So we are at the end of the session for today. I'm just going to very quickly scan uh, the comments. And Cool Beans, if you have a comment, if you can please put a QQ in front of it, that allows me to identify it out of all other. I had seen a comment here. Uh, here, Pam is jamming, says, does diverticulosis cause constipation if feces get lodged in the pockets? Um, the answer is no, but constipation causes the pockets because the constipation causes the sort of poor peristalsis of that area. 
there's no question that these two are related. I think your question mostly is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, now, diverticulosis can cause diverticulitis, which is an inflammation, which can then cause constipation. Um, that is a very adult problem. I'm a pediatric colorectal provider, um, but I know a little bit about adult colorectal too, and um, it's an important discussion. Uh, but I um, essentially, the constipation is the first manifestation, um, and then the pocketing of the uh, curves of the colon occur thereafter. Got it. Two or three more questions. So Pam is jamming has one more question. I think she is going to become a doctor as well. Are suppositories a good stimulant as well? So suppositories basically soften the stool that's in the rectal vault. There are some suppositories that have a stimulant component to them. So there are certain suppositories that in fact can stimulate the stool. I am much more of a fan of stimulating the stool from above with medicine that you take orally. But the answer to your question is suppositories do work. They soften the stool and they can actually provoke the rectum to empty that stool. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Adeline, Adeline Marie says, does warm prune juice work? Yeah, so prune juice is a very good laxative, but for many of our patients, it's not a strong enough laxative to be adequately effective. But for mild constipation, it's very good, a very effective strategy. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Ramnik says dehydration also worsens constipation. Does constipation improve absorption of nutrients because of longer transit time? So another really nice question. Yes, we talked about the dehydration issue. Um, constipation does not improve absorption by slowing things down. All of the absorption of nutrients occurs in the small bowel and constipation is a colon, a large bowel phenomenon. But relative to nutrition, constipation can make the child feel bloated and full and they don't want to eat. So it's not uncommon that we have a constipated child that is not a good eater and doesn't have the best nutrition. And when you improve the colonic emptying, they are less full and they become hungrier and they eat better. So if I may just go off a bit of a tangent on that question, that's the relationship I believe between uh, the colon and nutrition. Got it. Thank you very much. One more question. Kelly says, what is the top recommendation these days for functional constipation? When my kids were young, it was Miralax. So Miralax is used by a lot of pediatricians for mild constipation, but it really doesn't help the ones with the more severe constipation. And as I mentioned, it's a stool softener. I may not have mentioned that this particular medicine is a stool softener. And my preference is to provoke the stool with a laxative effect. And the two medicines that have a laxative effect are something with senna, which is a plant-based, very natural laxative, um, or bisacodyl, which is a medication that also provokes the stool. I will also mention that breast milk is an excellent laxative. So patients on breast milk are rarely constipated. Very interesting. Baby, babies, I mean. A couple of uh, more questions, if you are open to it. Sure. Uh, old Grizzly says, any additions to diet to reduce effects of steatoria other than getting dose of artificial enzymes? Yeah, so that's a very adult form of a question because um, enzymes and steatorrhea is not something I deal with very much. That's more of a gastroenterology problem. Uh, there are patients with cystic fibrosis who have that issue um, where they can't absorb fat well, um, and enzymes uh, do have that effect. But I don't really have, the, I'm not really the best person to answer that specific question. I'm sorry. Got it. Thank you very much. This is a good question. Uh, Again, I don't know if it is relevant to the pediatric surgery side or not. Is magnesium supplementation a good something? Yes. Um, magnesium, I believe, again, this is not a pediatric 
uh, entity really that we worry about or think about. But I do believe magnesium helps to provoke the stool. Um, but again, I'm not I'm not very knowledgeable about the use of magnesium to treat constipation. Got it. So these are the questions for today. And thank you so much for your brilliant talks. I believe that these are one of the most important talks on our channel. We've done a lot of COVID talks. We've done a lot of other talks as well. But these are the areas where patients suffer, families are unaware, they become surprised, as you have mentioned many times as well. So for them to be able to learn and understand what's happening and for doctors to learn and understand how to manage and you and your team's contribution, this is an amazing set of talks. And thank you very much for doing well, this. Well, I really appreciate that. I will tell you, when it comes to constipation, um, you're not going to believe this, but 10% of all pediatric office visits involve constipation. And constipation is the number one cause of a presentation to the ER in a child with abdominal pain. So it is remarkably common. And um, the good news, it is significantly treatable. Absolutely. And so with this so uh, as Elaine says your lectures are the absolute best so once again thank you very much uh, we are for the cool beans here we are talking with one of the world's top or the top surgeon in pelvic reconstruction surgery so once again dr levitt thank you very much for your time any uh, there is one more question and then we break for sure so rajesh says constipation due to lack of peristaltic movements Yes, that's essentially why the colon moves slowly. We don't know exactly why the peristaltic wave is slow. We know we can speed it up to improve constipation. But yes, when the peristaltic waves, the movement of the colon, the muscular contraction of the colon is slow, that leads to constipation. On the next session of this particular talk, we will describe some of the treatments, particularly why a surgeon like myself is talking to you about what would seem to be a medical problem, but we have some nice surgical solutions for patients with these problems. So with this, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the discussion. Cool beans, thank you, thank you very much. And we would see you the next time. Thank you so much.